Okay, thank you. So thank you so much for joining us at the Spring Entry Gardening webinar. And Mark, I'm going to let you get started with our introductions. Thank you very much, Sarah. Yes, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our last webinar of the day. Uh, hope you enjoyed all the previous ones. Hope you found some time. Uh, they were fantastic. Uh, so uh, thank you all again for attending this last one. Our topic for today is common landscaping make mistakes and how to avoid them. Uh, so I have today on the panel two wonderful and longtime gardeners, Laura Rogers and Rachel Swinsky. They're both from Gardening Volunteers of South Texas. And I would encourage you to go onto their website and find all about their, pro, their, their group and their organization. Today, uh, we're gonna zip right into it. Um, I'm gonna end up the program a little bit with some of the common mistakes I have discovered over the past 40 years living here in South Texas. But without uh, further ado, we're gonna go right to Sarah and she's gonna get some of of our housekeeping duties out of the way. Fantastic. So like Mark said, he's going to be covering, um, well, the three of them will be covering many different ways to avoid making mistakes in your landscape. Um, but some of the housekeeping things that he mentioned, I just want to remind you about some of the webinar functions if you've joined us before. And if not, these may be new to you. So at the bottom right of your screen, you should see a chat and a Q&A button. However, you might have to click on the icon with three dots to find one or both of those functions. Additionally, please make sure that you put your questions into the Q&A box as we go along and don't put them into the chat. That makes it easier for us to gather them up because we will be answering them at the end of this presentation. Additionally, this webinar is going to be recorded and posted onto the Garden Style San Antonio website. So don't worry if you miss something, you can find the webinar and a bunch of other things on our website. Um, for those of you who are joining us for a rewards point, this is a rewards eligible webinar, um, Water Saver Rewards. So if you're not already a member, or you're not familiar with the program, we'd recommend that you uh, sign up or visit gardenstylesanantonio.com to sign up. I did already get one question from someone attending about um, the survey and the keyword. So during our presentation today, there will be a keyword that you will need in order to get your point for attending this presentation. And you will enter that keyword into a quiz that you take to um, basically prove to us that you are paying attention and listening. So at the end of this webinar, when uh, the webinar ends, you will be redirected to that survey. However, if something happens, you can also find that survey link on the Garden Style San Antonio events calendar page. And I will also be putting the link to this pr uh, presentation survey in the chat several times throughout. So um, just make sure that you pay attention for that code word and be sure to take that quiz before the end of the day. So now we've got all that settled, let's go ahead and get started with our presentation, Mark. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, let me reintroduce Laura Rogers from Gardening Volunteers of South Texas. She's gonna be talking about what to know before you plant. Take it away, Laura. Thank you very much for having me this morning. Uh, what to know before you plant, that sounds fairly simple. You go to the nursery, you buy a plant, and you bring it home and plant it. But there are a lot of things that go before that can really throw a wrench in the machinery. Uh, the sunlight that you have around your house, none today, but sometimes you'll get some, and especially in July. The type of soil that you have in your landscape, whether you have a slope, uh, the seasons for planting and blooming, we're blessed here in San Antonio to not have ground that freezes. So we don't have to wait till the ground thaws before we plant. And we can plant multiple times during the year, but there are the better times. And of course, spacing plants uh, for their mature size. It's always interesting to where you can drive around San Antonio sometimes and you can see a tree that was placed in what someone thought about would be a nice place, but that tree is going to grow. Next slide. How much sun hits the place where I want the, to plant? This is very important, very, is absolutely vital here in San Antonio because the morning sun is very gentle and the afternoon sun about six months out of the year is just gonna fry everything. But all plants do require some sun. So you need to understand which 
types of sun you have in your property at your house? Do you have full sun? Is that sun out there all day, every day? Uh, sun less than eight hours, that puts you into the partial shade, and that would mean different plants from what will survive in that full sun. If you put a full sun plant in afternoon sun only, I'm sorry, into morning sun only, you're going to not be successful because that plant will not get enough sun to grow and to blossom and to be a healthy plant. And reverse side, if you have a plant that says shade, it needs to not be out in the sun and especially in the afternoon. There's a couple of spots that are really can be challenging and one is where you get afternoon sun only. This would say be on the side of your house that faces west and there's no trees or other buildings or fences to block that sun. The other place where you're going to get full sun probably is that cement area next to your bed or next to the house or next to the driveway because that's going to create just an oven to kind of cook your plants. Next slide. So what kind of soil do I have? Uh, there's a difference between soil and dirt. You want soil, you want a good quality soil because the soil is always the, the foundation of your, any of the planting that you do. If you have good soil, you're going to have good healthy plants. And of course it depends upon where you live in Bear County. Uh, Bear County is a pretty good size area. Texas is huge. So a soil that is in East Texas is completely different from what we have here in Bear County. So you need to go out and look at your soil and see what you have. Do you have a lot of rocks? Do you have a very shallow soil? A lot of areas around San Antonio live on rock and some areas of San Antonio live on sand. So finding out what kind of soil you have, that will help you understand how much water you will need to provide for this, for the plants that you're going to give them. And it'll also let you know how much organic material you need to add to your soil. Organic material is a be wonderful and that's going to make any area a better foundation. Next slide. What can I do to improve my soil? Uh, always, always, always try to improve your soil no matter where you live. It's just like uh, our uh, diet. We want to make sure that our diet is good and if your soil has had a good diet, then it's going to feed your plants better. Uh, applying an inch of compost or composted manure uh, over your your area once a year would be really good. Uh, peat moss uh, is not a native to this area, so it's, it will not do as, bad, as good a job as your compost. Um, make sure that you water this in, whether you're putting it on your turf or whether you're putting it on your beds. To scatter an inch of compost over your area and to water it in thoroughly is going to really help all of your plants, whether you're looking at your turf grass or whether you're looking at your individual gardens. Spreading two inches of bark or wood chip mulch in late spring and early fall on beds only. The bark and the wood chip mulch is something that really, really helps, and especially in the summer. In the summertime, we get some very hot temperatures here, and that two to three inches of bark and wood chip mulch is going to help maintain a lower temperature in your yard, and it's also going to help keep the moisture in there. There are some products that are on the market that uh, just read the uh, labels and make sure you're buying a Texas product and uh, spread that two inches. I like to say two, 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 two inches of bark, wood chip mulch, two times a year, two inches from the base of the tree and your plants will be happy campers. Next slide. 
does it matter if I'm planting on a slope? Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, if you're on a slope and your yard goes down like this one, you're gonna need something to keep the rainfall. And it does rain here. Usually it rains 18 inches and then we don't get any for another six to eight months. But when you get a large rainfall, it can really do some damage to your landscape. So look the next time it rains or when you run your sprinkler system, does the water pool in a small depression or does that water run down the street and uh, out into the, to the drainage system? You wanna keep as much moisture on your property as you possibly can. Sometimes that means you need to slow down the water runoff with either metal edging, rock borders, uh, or terracing. And this could be a project that either you do yourself or that you hire someone to do. But it's really important to keep as much moisture that comes down on your property as possible. Next slide. What seasons are best for planting here? There are always good seasons for planting everywhere, but in San Antonio, we have fall and winter, which are optional and especially for your larger trees and everything. And I'm sure Mark will, will know about this because he's the tree guy. Putting those plants in in the fall and winter we're not going to have the ground freeze, so you don't have to worry about that. But the, also the plants are not going to be having to put out leaves, so they're gonna be putting out roots, and that is your foundation of your plant. So the, the roots will go down and they will be able to form and create a good surface for the plants to bloom the next year. Uh, summer's a good time for palms, turf, and succulents. You will always have to provide some additional water for these plants when you first plant them. So make sure that you can give them a little bit of tender loving care when you first put them in the ground. And make sure that you try to get most of this stuff in before it really gets really hot. Next slide. Where do I space my planting holes? It's very interesting, you go to the nursery and you see a little plant and the little plant's in a little tiny pot and that little tiny plant can get up to five, six feet. So always consult a guide so that you know how big that plant will be at maturity. Now, if a plant is in a really good place and is happy, it could get even bigger than that. And this can also, tell you how you're going to put those plants in, putting them in the planting holes so that you guide so that when your plant grows up, it's not going to be involved with other plants or it's not going to be a nuisance. Next slide. This gives you a little bit of a visual of how your large plants might get. And you could put cut large pieces of cardboard and lay them out on your ground to say how wide the plant will be. Also, you need to remember how tall they will be. So you don't want to plant them too close to each other so that as they grow up, they would interfere. Lay these pieces of cardboard on the ground and this will give you a better visual of how big, how wide that plant will be at maturity. So you can adjust your space. Always remember to allow that foot of space so between those squares or your plants, because you're gonna have to walk around those plants at different parts and points in time. You're gonna have to do some pruning on them every now and then. And of course, adding mulch a couple of times a year. So you don't want the plants so close together that you cannot give them a little bit of tender loving care. Next. There are several resources that are available. There are three books, if you like books that have uh, uh, lovely pictures. There's one from Austin, Native and Adapted Landscape Plants. It gives you a ton of information. The TNLA Best of Texas Landscape Guide is good. And also on Garden Style SA, if you go out there, they've got some plant information and they've got planting information and different other hints that are gonna make your 
planting experience worry-free and hopefully mistake-free. Thank you, Laura, so much for that. Uh, a lot of good ideas, a lot of good hints on that. Uh, up next is Rachel, and she's going to be talking about one of my favorite topics. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Uh, no, not how to do one of my favorite topics. Uh, so, Rachel, take it away. Thank you, Mark. I am Rachel with Gardening Volunteers of South Texas, and I'm here to tell you how to kill a tree, or for all of us who are optimists, how not to plant a tree. Well, one way to kill a tree, obviously, is just starve it from the get-go. Don't let those roots have anywhere to get any food, and it won't last too long. Or you can be a little more creative and burn it. Get that tree in there and then uh, just don't give it any mulch. Keep that soil hot. And just think of this. If you're on that asphalt parking lot here and it's 130 or 150 degrees in the summer, you think it's hot. Just think how hot it is for that tree because their tree roots don't grow above 80 degrees. Once the soil hits 80 degrees, it stops growing. If you just Keep that up enough. You could probably keep the tree from ever having roots that grow. Or a little more devious, you could boil the tree. And you could just not let any of those little plants that naturally grow around the tree trunk grow. Or even worse, you can plant grass right up to the tree trunk. So the grass takes all of the water that the tree would get. And make sure you trim so that you see at least one third of the tree trunk and then just keep inching it up like these people. Look how devious they were. If you look at this, it looks like there's still foliage on the tree, but they actually exposed 100% of the tree trunk and there's nothing, no little plants covering it. That sap is going to boil every time the sun hits it. There is no way that tree can make it. And if you want to really make a slow and torturous death for a tree, just keep piling soil up around the trunk until you can't see where those roots flare out at the bottom anymore. Make it look like a toothpick, just like a straight line, like it's not really a tree at all. And eventually it will suffocate, but it's the long, slow death where you see all the trees just start to defoliate at the top. And you start seeing bare branches, and then the leaves keep falling off farther and farther down until eventually it dies. Oh, and this is a smorgasbord of possibilities for killing a tree. There are so many ways to dehydrate that tree. You can All you have to do is just bust up that fungal network like this guy here. Just bust up the soil. You could till it. You could trench it. Or just keep running a lawnmower over it. And you're going to take all that fungus out of the soil that the tree relies on to get the water into its roots to begin with. But say you didn't do that. You could just do something a little more simple and not so obvious, like banging a lawnmower into the tree trunk, or maybe just taking the tree and trimmer and just nicking the, trim, the tree trunk a few times here, off, here and there. And it's just like... If San Antonio water system were keeping the water flowing through the water main, but you broke all the pipes that take it up to your house, no matter how much water you pour on that tree, once you get rid of that infrastructure, it can't take up the water and it's going to die. Ah, now and if all else fails, you can just squish those tree roots and compact that soil so tightly that when the rain falls on it, it just cannot get into the soil at all. I mean, you could do it the slow and easy way, like just walking across the tree roots all the time without putting any mulch or pavers or anything there. I'm not gonna kill it, you know. But if you really want to do this well, just use a leaf blower like maybe once a week or so. Oh my gosh, the, the force coming out of that leaf blower, like right here in this video, is as powerful as a tornado wind. 
I mean, if you got hit by a tornado every week, how long would you live? <laughs> oh, my gosh. There are so many ways to kill a tree. <laughs> but in summary, we can sum them all up by saying, if you treat a tree like it's not really a living being, like it's more like a statue, eventually it won't be. <laughs> but we here uh, today are here to tell you that we know trees are living beings, and we hope that you will always treat them that way because we want you to have success with your trees. That's why we're here. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about my observations on the uh, the last 40 years of, of living in here in South Texas. Of, of Hopefully I can help you with uh, these common mistakes and how to avoid them. Please uh, remember that there is a survey at the end of this program, and we're going to give you some secret words. But please, if you are a rewards member, please fill out that survey, and you'll be able to get a point today. So, Sarah, if you will. Mark's quick four ideas. All right, four quick common mistakes that I have identified over the past 40 years. Spacing between plants and buildings. Laura's already talked about that. I also want to talk about the number of plants per bed, the bed size and shape, and finally, consistent watering. You want to establish your new plants, you have to be consistent about consistent and constant watering. So. Next slide. All right, as I said, uh, Laura has mentioned this, but the uh, 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 dwarf yopons and live oaks, they are planted much closer together than they should be. So please identify that right off the base, uh, right off the spot. Next slide. All right, so when, uh, when spacing plants, Think about what is the mature size. Uh, note the three dimensions, width, length, and height, uh, to look all around and decide uh, how far that tree or how much space that tree will, or plant, see, I'm a tree person, uh, how much space that plant will require as a mature plant. Uh, if you do not know, then you can go to GardenStyleSanAntonio.com. It's a great resource uh, on every uh, web page that we have for a plant. We will mention the size and length and height at maturity. Something that is rarely spoken of is buildings. Trees and shrubs that are 18 feet or less, you really should put uh, them 10 feet or less from the building. If the tree or shrub is 30 feet or more, then please put that no closer than 15 feet, but you have a range of 15 feet to 20 feet from the building. Next slide. Okay, Mark, and I'm gonna interrupt your presentation real quick to provide that Water Saver Awards quiz code. So the code for today is spacing. Be sure to write this down in order to get your point for your Water Saver Rewards. You do have to have this code word spacing to enter into your quiz. So again, don't forget to complete that survey with this code by the end of the day in order to get your points. You can find the quiz at gardenstylesanantonio.com under the events uh, calendar, but I've also been pasting a link repeatedly into the chat. So um, be sure to get that done today. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. All right. so. Uh, Another item that's not commonly talked about, but I see problems all the time, number of plants per bed. We have a range here of really a lot of overcrowding because of the number of beds, primarily because they want to put a lot of plants when they're small. Or we have the other problem where we don't have hardly any plants. We have uh, actually three little rows plants with a couple of other little sages. Not a whole lot. So what do we do? Next slide. So we try to uh, provide a little harmony to the beds. 
knowing that they the plants in the beds will get bigger over time. So we work with individual plants. We uh, we work with odd numbers three, five, seven, and nine. So you may want to have three lantana, five salvia, uh, or or seven uh, frog fruit or lorope. Depends on how you do that, but generally it's more pleasing to the eye with the odd numbers. Now you take the next step is how many of the species do you put in a bed? You should probably put anywhere from four to five maximum. Otherwise, if you have too many, it's chaotic. If you have too few, it's not uh, unified enough. So you want a, a harmon harmonic cohesive number in a bed. So some examples here from the San Antonio Botanical Garden and also from the Frederick Meyer Gardens uh, back in West Michigan, my home area. Next slide. All right, this is my, oh, bed shape and size. I'm getting woozy, I'm getting woozy. You see this from homeowners and professionals all the time, this wavy pattern. Uh, and you'll see it in uh, uh, tracks and pathways as well. They have to put some kind of wave in there. Uh, no, not necessarily. Next slide. So what, so what, uh, um, shape and size should we do? Well, you see some more additional patterns here. Uh, no, you should expand outward from the trunks. Uh, you should never have a bed ending or having it closer than three feet to the trunk of a tree or large shrub. They should always be three to six feet away. So, and uh, the, the landscape on the left, we should probably have combined both of those beds into one large bed. And on the right, uh, just a different perspective from this landscape, we should have pulled that wire, uh, the, the metal edging out uh, another uh, three to six feet. Next slide. All right, so uh, what type of bed shape should we use? We should always talk about using an S-shape or kidney-shaped bed. Uh, here's some examples here. Uh, on the left, we have a, a bed with a, a what we call an S-shape edge to it. Um, this is can be different sizes and different shape. It is kind of evokes an S-shape. And then on the, uh, the Right-hand side, we have this lovely path, kind of, again, an S shape moving through the landscape. So we don't necessarily have to do more than one curve is what we're saying. Next slide, please. So here we have the ideal separation. We like to have the trees and shrubs in one area and the turf in the other. So on the left-hand side, this is more of a rural site over at Valero Corporation. Uh, they have an ideal situation here where they have the trees and shrubs and understory on one side and the grass on the other. The landscape on the left, or on the right rather, uh, is what I call an ideal landscape. So we have some turf, a small amount of turf on the front, and then the uh, beds uh, filled with numerous uh, uh, plants, but not too many, just a, a consistent harmony of skull cap, ornamental grasses, some plants. Yes, I, I know that the, the tall shrub is too close. However, if you were listening this morning to Juan, uh, he may have talked about uh, the saw's ideal landscape is one third, one third, one third. So that's one third turf, one third beds, and one third patio space. Uh, and and we we have uh, we had a program with uh, pervious materials. We are rearranging that, and Juan explained that all this morning. Look for that on GardenStyleSA.com. Uh, so, uh, next slide. All right, so uh, as I mentioned, consistent watering uh, is, early watering is the key to maintaining the survival of your landscape. Uh, I have a rule, uh, it's called the three, two, one rule. It's sweeping the country uh, and you can find the, this rule, which is on the left-hand side at gardeningstylesanantonio.com. 
under the resource section it explains everything the concept is you're watering many times frequently but little amounts so uh and then you gradually change to as the plant grows to infrequent uh deeper amounts so that's kind of the key it's consistent constant watering but the methodology slightly changes over time and then i couldn't resist i have a a, a diagram of historic rainfall for texas south texas notice the two humps uh, and then you have the standard turf requirement so if you look at that you're going hmm, maybe i shouldn't start watering until late april may probably may and then maybe I don't need to water in, until middle of September. So I always give that a thought. You, if you're turning on your irrigation early in the spring or late in the fall, you're probably wasting water. So uh, I believe that is my last slide, Sarah. Yes, and thank you so much to Laurel, Rachel, and you, of course, Mark, for this wonderful presentation. They're just so many things to know about raising a landscape in the right way. And we appreciate each of you sharing your expertise. So at this time, we are going to get started with some questions from our audience. Okay, so first question is, is it true that in South Texas, only six hours of sun constitutes full sun? Does anyone want to answer that? I, I would probably say no, but uh, Laura was correct. It, uh, it depends on the time of day. So six hours of early morning sun is not full sun, but six hours of uh, afternoon sun would really constitute some some harsh conditions. So uh, when you say six hours, when do you mean it? Morning or sun? What do you think, Laura? I agree. And it depends upon what the plant is and where it is. If if it's close to the house and it's getting some shade from the house or a fence, that's going to cut into that number of hours. And like Mark said, if you if we're talking about sunshine in February, that's a lot different from the sunshine in July and August. Okay, fantastic. Um, so that was the only question we got about sunlight. We did get quite a few questions, however, about uh, mulch and compost. So in regards to mulch, um, one person asked, is it okay to use oak leaves for mulch? And another person asked, is there any specific type of mulch materials that should be avoided? Mark, you want me to take that? Yeah, I was going to say take that because uh, a couple of days ago or yesterday, in fact, we're, we were talking about it at length, Laura and I. So, Laura? Take it away. Okay. Uh, in the San Antonio area, the best mulch is chopped hardwood mulch. You can use leaves, any leaves. You can use your, your oak tree leaves or any of the other leaves that collect in your yard. If you have a mulching more and you, more and you mulch them up and put them on the top of your, your ground, that would be good because in the uh, there are no leaf blowers and bagging systems in the forest, and they seem to do fairly well. Uh, the hardwood mulch is the best kind. Get some from a, a reputable dealer. Uh, there are several mulches that you can use, but they're not going to help your landscape as much. Uh, your cypress mulch, a lot of that is coming from uh, uh, Louisiana and it's old growth, and so we don't want to use that here. Uh, pine mulch comes from East Texas. That's still part of Texas, but that's not this part of Texas. Uh, you don't see a whole lot of pine trees in San Antonio, so pine mulch is not going to change the ability of your soil to support azaleas. Uh, some of the other mulches, the cedar mulch, I have friends who said that it helps somewhat with cutting down on fleas. I don't have dogs, so I don't know, but it is a renewable source in San Antonio. Your hardwood mulches are the best. Uh, there's some of them that are uh, dyed red and black and everything, 
uh, the San Antonio South Texas sun is going to bleach those out really fast. I would just get a good hardwood mulch and utilize it two, two inches, two times a year, two inches from the base of the tree. And that base of the tree thing is something that Rachel talked about. Don't pile that mulch up the base of the tree, please. Put it two to three inches away from the base of the tree, please. Uh, Mark, if I could add that um, there's a good reason to keep your leaves in the landscape because some butterfly species and bees overwinter in the leaves. And if you remove them, then you are going to be killing some butterflies. That's right, Rachel. Uh, there's a there's a lot of moths and some butterflies that actually pupate and underneath the the foliage, and uh, you remove those. You remove those butterflies. So uh, the the only thing I'd add to Laura is yes, I do use bark sometimes, but remember, uh, but basically the reason why is because they are mostly lignin and they don't decompose very fast. However, the other side of the coin is they don't de decompose, but they're not providing carbon to the uh, micro uh, organisms and the macroorganisms. Carbon is the gasoline which runs the entire ecosystem. So what we call the rhizosphere, the soil ecosystem. So that is the benefit of mulch as well. As it decomposes, it protects the trees, and as it decomposes, it provides energy to the whole ecosystem. All right, I went on. So, <laughs> so one last question on the topic of mulch. Um, what is the well, mulch and compost? What is the best time of year to apply mulch slash compost? I know they're separate things. Spring and fall. For both of them. No, no. For the mulch, generally on the compost, we do it a little earlier. Uh, so. Uh, earlier, I think uh, we had circled uh, like uh, March and April and then September, October I, on one of the slides, but we do mulch uh, or compost rather uh, generally in March and then uh, we can do it later in the October, November time. Oh, yeah. And then some kind of question that's a really good question. I don't I have no idea what the answer is. What is a soil conditioner? Because I've heard of them. No idea what it means. I just think of like hair conditioner. So you have soft soil. I don't know. Uh, 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 it's, uh, yeah, it's conditioner. It's a product. It makes your landscape beautiful. It's conditioner. Actually, Laura's already talked about that. Why don't you hit that again, on Laura? What 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 a conditioner is? A conditioner is merely a name for a product that you're going to put on your landscape, i.e., compost. I.e. mulch. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be something that's going to provide some. Your your chopped up leaves can be considered a soil conditioner because they're going to decompose into the soil and they're going to help it. Using a natural product that's already in your yard or that you can obtain at the at the Bitters Road. Uh, facility is is going to be much better than importing something from another area or bringing in something that you don't know what all is in that bag that you don't you don't want to put something on your on your property that's that's going to harm something like the butterflies fantastic well thank you very much for that and another question we've got from someone is um Earlier in the presentation, I believe, Mark, you had talked about plant width, height, and length. What do those measurements refer to in regards to a plant? I think specifically there was questions around length. Well, uh, and uh, I, okay. I say that just because sometimes you have a plant which is, when we say width, is assumed that's going to be round in all directions. On that, so I just add length in there because if you had a certain plant, a certain shrub, which was against a a building or so, it might spread lengthwise but not width, and so you see lots of times shrubs doing that. Uh, so that's why I kind of like included the third dimension and that uh, width, length, and height. 
but uh, we're mostly concerned about the 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 directional movement of not the movement, directional growth of the plant as well as height, and we often forget about height, and so that's why I want to stress that, uh, particularly when we have shrubs like crepe myrtles uh, or other uh, small trees underneath power lines. It's very important to know what the height of the tree is going to be. Fantastic. Thank that's you. Right. Yeah. You had also made a mention around um, the S-shaped curve yeah. of a landscape bed and using that over multiple curves. Yeah. Beyond purely visual, are there any other reasons for that? Is it just that the single S curve is? Yeah, it's a little bit. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit more aesthetic. Um, I know lots of professionals like multiple curves, but uh, I find just that that S shape to be aesthetically more pleasant and more natural. Okay. We don't see many humps like uh, that in the in nature. This is true. Um, in regards to uh, spring pruning of native plants, do you have any specific recommended resources or approaches as to how to go about that? How to go about that? Blooms in the spring, you prune after the bloom. Blooms in the summer, you prune in the fall. So there you go. That's it right there. I think you'll see that in most manuals on that. Now shrubs, pretty much the same way. Uh, if it blooms in the spring, then then please wait till after it blooms before pruning. I think it's just a nice general rule. And Mark, since you're the tree guy, uh, what about trimming and pruning an oak tree in the San Antonio area? What are the times for that? Laura, you will get your check in the mail about uh, <laughs> leading me in the segue. Uh, yes, uh, folks, um, oak wilt is uh, spread during this period of time. Uh, generally, February 15th, to June 15th, please do not prune during this period of time. If you must prune, paint. And in fact, it is city ordinance. You must paint within 30 minutes. Uh, paint uh, is uh, anything you want, spray paint, latex, oil-based, purple, if you so desire, uh, Elmer's glue, if you need to, um, it's all on there, but uh, you should paint year-round, but especially the springtime of the year, because the trees are most susceptible and the, the fungus is most prevalent out there. And uh, an easy way to remember that would be CCC. Oh, See, clean, make sure whoever's trimming in your property has a clean uh, saw or whatever they're using. Cut, make a good clean cut. Don't make a jagged cut and cover with the paint. So if you remember your C's, you'll be good. Mark will be proud of you. <laughs> Anything else, Sarah, on our questions? We're nearing our time. So, so I think we have... Um, one more question I think is pretty solid. Um, so earlier Rachel had talked about suffocating, I believe, a tree by covering up the roots of that tree and putting too much mulch, too much soil, whatever it might be. Um, if that happens, if you inherit a tree who has been tormented in this way, is there a way that you can, you know, revive this tree if it's starting to get stressed out? Is there anything you can do to reverse the damage that's been done? Yes, to some extent you can try excavating, but this is a really good time to actually consult an ISA certified arborist and um, get that. But the thing is immediately take the cover off anywhere that there's actual bark on the tree trunk that has been covered up by soil, immediately remove that. Um, and perhaps our ISA certified arborist um, would like to add something, by the way, I just have to say, for those of you all who don't know, in his previous career at the Texas Forest Service, Mark Peterson won the highest possible award an arborist can receive as Arborist of the Year. And I'm so glad and thankful to Mark that he has chosen to make his second career at San Antonio Water System. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Sarah. Sarah. Rachel is correct. Um, you need to get uh, any, anything you can away from the trunk of the tree. Um, 
the further away the possible. Uh, there is no farther away that I think than probably the drip line that you get rid of all that on the drip line. But yeah, mulch is mulch and, and what's called out there living mulch, which is merely compost and mulch mixed together. That would be a great uh, a selection, great product to use uh, throughout the tree, underneath the, the tree canopy, but away from the trunk. Okay, well, fantastic. Um, it's now 1245, so we have hit the end of our time, unfortunately. However, I do want to say thank you again so much to Mark and Rachel and Laura for coming out and sharing all of their knowledge with us about what not to be doing in your landscape. Um, and additionally, I want to remind everyone to go take your quiz so you can get your garden style um, water saver rewards quiz. And if you have any questions that didn't get answered today, don't worry. You can always go to gardenstyleessay.com and submit your questions to the Garden Geek. Mark will personally answer them um, Monday morning, first thing right away. Every single question will get answered. <laughs> Joke. But um, anyways, make sure you take your quiz. And again, thank you so much for attending our webinar today. Um, and we hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.